Hey everyone, today we are looking into Giulia Tolfana, an obscure figure from 17th century Italy, who is said to have been responsible for killing as many as 600 people by poisoning them. Yet to this day, many elements surrounding her life remain clouded in mystery. This is her story. Giulia Tolfana appears to have been a Sicilian who was most likely born in the 1590s or 1600s. She came from a humble background and there is almost zero information available about her early life. Indeed, the first references to her do not appear until the early 1630s, by which time she was an adult. The only other ascertainable facts about her is that she seems to have been a native of the city of Palermo in Sicily, where she was living at the time of her first appearance on the historical record. It has often been conjectured that she was the daughter of Tofania da Damo, a belief which is based on the fact that many people in 17th century Italy took a parent's first name and used it as their surname. Thus, Tofania da Damo became Giulia Tofana. Yet there may well be no familial link between the two, and observers may simply have been too eager to see a mother-daughter connection between two generations of Sicilian poisoners. What is relatively clear is that Giulia Tofana did work with and knew Tofania Dadamo in the early 1630s. On the 12th of July 1633, Tofania was executed in Palermo for having poisoned individuals with a concoction which a contemporary Italian diarist, Gaetano Alessi, called Aqua Tofania. Thus, the poison later known as Aqua Tofana might well have originated with Tofania Dadamo, but it is with Giulia Tofana and her notorious misdeeds in the 1630s and 1640s that it is generally associated. Exactly what the relationship between the two women was is unclear. Ancillary evidence indicates that Tofania Dadamo's main accomplice in Palermo prior to being arrested, tried and executed was one Francesca Lasarda, and she was arrested a year before Tofania was. However, it is also fairly clear that while she was not mentioned in the trial proceedings or prosecuted in Palermo at this trial, Giulia Tofana was involved with Tofania and La Sarda, as she was part of a group of women who quickly left Palermo in the aftermath of Tofania Dadamo's arrest and execution. These settled in Rome and were soon distributing their own version of Aqua Tofana. It is worth pausing at this point to consider what exactly Aqua Tofana is. While its exact chemical composition is not entirely clear, it appears to have principally consisted of a base of arsenic, antimony, and lead. Other accounts of the 17th century include the addition of corrosive sublimate, which was a contemporary term for mercuric chloride, a mixture of mercury and chlorine. This mixture of chemicals, if administered in a sufficient dose, will prove fatal in about three days. Records of the time indicate that the first symptoms which came on after being poisoned by Aquatolfana were a burning throat, followed by nausea, vomiting, extreme thirst, and diarrhea. The great attraction of Aquatolfana as a poison is that arsenic is tasteless and was almost completely undetectable in the 17th century. In an age where the study of toxicology was relatively limited, nobody would know or could be sure that the victim had even been poisoned. Moreover, the early modern period was an age in which medicinal knowledge was still relatively lacking, and people often died quite suddenly from illnesses which could not be explained. As a result, Aquatolfana could be used to poison somebody without much suspicion being aroused, but at the same time, its clandestine use of it makes it difficult for us to know exactly how widely the poison may have been used in the 17th century. Even some of the deaths which would come to be associated with Giulia Tofana and her circle might well have been deaths 
from natural causes, which were misattributed to her schemes. While Tofania de Damo and Francesca Lasarda may have been the first mass murderers to use Aqua Tofana, it has become more commonly associated with Giulia Tofana. Having arrived to Rome in 1633, Giulia quickly established herself as the leader of Dadamo and Lazarda's former accomplices. She recruited a younger woman by the name of Girolama Spara as her assistant, and some others who were more familiar with Rome and its politics and society. According to one source from the 1650s, they obtained a supply of arsenic to begin making Aquatofana from Father Girolamo of Sant'Agnese in Agone, a church in central Rome. His brother was an apothecary and had access to the poison. The pair then made the arsenic into a version of aqua tofana by mixing it into a liquid and bottling it in glass jars, which they then whimsically identified as manna of Saint Nicholas. The poison was then sold incognito as a liquid, which allegedly removed facial blemishes. It is difficult to reassemble the exact details of who Tofana sold her poison to and what these same individuals were using it for. One generally doesn't go around advertising the details of who they are poisoning on a given day. However, details from the late 1650s during a trial of some of Tofana's own associates reveal some aspects of what occurred. Individuals from a varied range of Roman society were buying Aqua Tofana in the 1630s 1640s and 1650s. Many of them came from the poor and middle classes of the city, but some were also highly connected within Roman society. For instance, the wife of the Duke of Cherry, a very high-ranking Roman noble, was said to have poisoned her husband. Aspects of the trials at this time were swept under the carpet to protect several socially prominent individuals in Rome and within the church from the scandal. The Duchess of Cherry's story was not uncommon. She appears to have purchased and used Aquatofana on her husband as a way of escaping from a loveless marriage to a much older man. It has been suggested that people such as her probably made up a substantial portion of Tofana's client base. In a society in which misogyny was the absolute norm and domestic abuse was not uncommon, women had little way of challenging a drastically unhappy marriage through any legal means. As such, it is not surprising to learn that many women in early modern Italy turned to poisoners such as Giulia Tofana to help them get out of their difficult situation. The view that one of the primary uses of poisons such as Aqua Tofana in early modern times was for women to try and escape torrid marriages is further suggested by the fact that the trade in poisons was usually dominated by women. Thus, the available records, fragmentary as they are, suggest that Tofana was selling much of her product to women looking to poison their husbands. The exact scale of her business is unclear. Some contemporary records suggest she may have been responsible in one fashion or another for poisoning up to 600 people. However, it can be hard to believe such figures. If 600 people had died in Rome and the surrounding region over a 20 year period with similar mysterious symptoms, it likely would have aroused grave suspicions. Nevertheless, Tofana did have a competent circle working with her and clearly a large clientele who kept her secret safe and were satisfied with her product. Furthermore, the fact that the symptoms of the poison resembled that of an advancing disease meant that she could have easily been responsible for all these deaths without anyone catching on. Yet it's likely that Tofana and Spara did not just make their living from selling Aqua Tofana. Research in recent decades has revealed that those who produced poisons in European cities at the time, such as Paris, Venice and Rome, operated in a kind of magical underworld, one which combined the manufacture and sale of poisons with other activities, such as the production of magical charms and objects, palm reading, astrology, and organizing the occasional conventional murder by a contract killer. 
While records are fleeting, it is likely that Giulia Tolfana was also involved in activities of this kind. During the nearly 20 years she lived in Rome after relocating there from Palermo. The risks for Tolfana were very considerable. Well, if she was caught, she would suffer grave consequences. Poisoning people in this way was considered a particularly heinous crime in early modern times, and extreme punishments were handed out to those who engaged in such activity. For instance, there are two competing accounts of how Tofania Dadama was executed after her conviction in 1633. Neither are pretty. In one, she was hanged, drawn and quartered, while the other suggests she was bound up alive inside a canvas sack and thrown from the roof of the bishop's palace in Palermo into the street far below. Luckily for her, Giulia Tofana would suffer no such fate. Unlike her mentors in Palermo, Tofania D'Adamo and Francesca Lazarda, Giulia Tofana was never convicted of any crime relating to her activities as a maker and distributor of poisons, and by most accounts, she died peacefully in bed in 1651. But other tales of her demise tell another story. One claims that she lived out the remainder of her years in a convent, using a network of nuns and clerics to continue her business, while another account states that she was captured and executed, and others claim that she was strangled while living at the convent yet it would seem that these are untrue. Her assistant, Girolam Maspara, succeeded her as head of the network of women who distributed Aquatelfana around Rome in the mid-17th century. Eventually, in 1658, her activities came to the attention of the authorities in Rome, and after standing trial, she and several other ringleaders were hanged in public in Rome, while dozens others who had aided them or been implicated in buying their poisons, were sentenced to life in prison. The trials and subsequent events brought to light the extent of Tofana and Spara's clients and their positions within Roman society in the mid-17th century, with the aristocracy and even high-ranking churchmen implicated. Aqua Tofana continued to be known of and used well beyond Giulia Tofana's time the slow poison which she had devised had gained such notoriety by the early 18th century that aquatofana became a catch-all term which was used throughout Western and Central Europe to refer to any kind of slow poison. Toxic potions of this kind were believed to be responsible for many kinds of sudden or inexplicable deaths. One infamous example of an individual who was believed to have been killed by aquatofana was the great Austrian composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. He became ill in September 1791 and died just three months later, having become bedridden in his final weeks and suffering from pains, swelling and vomiting. The idea that he was dying from a slow poison originated from Mozart himself, who claimed, someone has given me aqua tofana and calculated the precise time of my death. There is no evidence to clearly indicate that he was poisoned, but at the same time, there is no consensus as to what actually caused his death, with scholars having suggested over a hundred different illnesses which might have been responsible. From rheumatic fever and trichinosis to influenza or kidney failure. However, it is possible that he died from some of the symptoms which Aquatofana would have induced, though in Mozart's instance, this was not owing to some malicious activity. Rather, mercury was used in many different common ways in society in the late 18th century, and a recent study has detected large amounts of arsenic on the manuscript of Die Zauberflute, the opera Mozart was working on at the time of his death. Thus, the Austrian composer might well have been the victim of some of the ingredients which Giulia Tofana placed in her slow poisons, but not of the poison itself. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Giulia Tofana. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know what you thought of it down below in the comments, and if you had any suggestions, also leave them in the comments. I hope you guys have notifications turned on, so you get all my videos as soon as I upload them. And anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you 
in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks 